Okie dokie, this is day three of um, these lessons. Okay, so please don't do this until after you've done two kinds and powder because the quiz at the bottom is going to have a little bit of everything. It's going to have vocabulary from two kinds and from powder because I'm doing this as though, you know, we're a real classroom, etc. Okay, so uh, today we're going to do a little bit of poetry, which is not my favorite thing. Uh, the first thing I'm going to confess is that for those of you who have read The Emperor's New Clothes, and if you haven't, you can just click on the link anytime it's blue that's a link that I've um, uh, linked to okay um, it's by Hans Christian Andersen and it's supposed to be this kind of like fairy tale that's allegorical and teaches us about things but in it there's this emperor and everybody keeps complimenting him on his wonderful new clothes um, and they just you know they can't they cannot see the new clothes okay uh, but they're afraid that they're gonna be the only one not saying oh my god your clothes are so amazing and so everybody keeps complimenting complimenting him and finally you know some kid says but he's naked he doesn't have any clothes um, and so you, you can read it I just unfortunately gave it away I'm so sorry if you didn't read it but read it either way it's a very good story about you know not um, not just kind of going with the flow and following along because everybody else is doing it um, and it's also I think sometimes about these inside jokes because I will admit that I've sometimes been the person who will say yes um, that looks amazing just because somebody else everybody else is saying it and I don't want to be the only one who admits that you know I don't get it okay and so I will say that most days both art and poetry are things that I kind of feel that way about okay there's a lot of art and I, I linked to this one. This one always makes me particularly feel feverish in the head. Okay, it's by Piet Mondrian, and this particular painting sold for uh, fifty point six million dollars. Okay, and this always drives me crazy because I, I am not an artist, and so I don't know that I can properly uh, prop properly understand um, why this would sell for that much. Okay, and I feel like it's it's a joke I'm not getting. I feel like it's a little bit um, Emperor's New Clothes, but you know. You know, I, I know that there are people who are way more knowledgeable about art than I am who could probably explain to me why that is a 50 million dollar painting okay um, and I will admit that even when I really like an artist so um, this man's name is Banksy uh, not his real name I believe that there are uh, plenty of things out there and that you know where people say they they kind of know um, who he is, that his identity is kind of a known secret. Um, I don't feel like I always get all of his art either. I can kind of appreciate it enough that I can say, oh, I, you know, like, for example, I, I see, you know, what we're saying about the environment maybe here and hunters. Um, he does a lot of graffiti. He does a lot of really, really interesting things. But sometimes I think my problem is that there are references here that I know I'm not getting because I just don't know enough art okay so uh, at one point in one of his pieces I know that he refer uh, references Cartier a, a jeweler um, and this particular panther within Cartier but you know don't since I don't own that jewelry um, I barely kind of got that reference okay and he also does various allusions to like religion remember an illusion just is supposed to call to mind some other work of art or literature without necessarily citing it and I know that some of his references I get some of his references references I don't get. Either way, I, I get that the art looks really cool. And so if you'd like to check out Banksy more, I've got the link there in the blue as well. Okay. But I think in poetry in particular, sometimes people get frustrated with it, not only because the, the grammar is different, the structure is different, but also it is so referential. Okay. Uh, William Carlos Williams poem, um, and apparently I put the, forgot to put the um, title here, but this is called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. Once again, landscape with the fall of Icarus, okay? And it's just totally referential. He, uh, it references all sorts of things. He was, uh, William Carlos Williams was a doctor and a poet, which means you totally like science and the humanities. A lot of times people say you're one or the other. Um, I was a chemical engineer once upon my life, but um, I also have an MFA in writing because I really like writing, okay? And to understand this poem uh, by William Carlos Williams, um, you have to do all sorts of things, okay? It says, according to Bruegel, when Icarus fell, it was spring. So first, you have to know who Bruegel was, and Bruegel was this uh, very famous Renaissance painter. He was uh, Dutch and Flemish, and he painted something called landscape 
fall of Icarus, right? Uh, and that is linked to uh, a picture that'll show you this. This is landscape with the fall of Icarus. And, um, you know, you, you have to then also know who Icarus is because Icarus is the person you've been told is falling here. And this is kind of, for those of you who um, are old enough um, or who have just seen it, there used to be these popular books called uh, Where is Wally or Where is Waldo? And you would look at these pictures and say, where is Waldo? Where is he? Where could he possibly be? Uh, and I feel like landscape with the fall of Icarus is like that. You've been told that this is a landscape and you see a farmer front and center. He is plowing his field, one of the vocab words we'll talk about in a second. And you're like, where's Icarus? Icarus fell, okay? And you have to look really, really closely in the bottom right-hand corner over here to see, oh, if I, if I zoom in here, you can see him splashing in this bottom right-hand corner here, okay? So that is called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus, uh, which is also what uh, the poem is called. <clears throat> and then you need to know the Greek myth about the fall of Icarus. You need to know that Icarus and his father Daedalus were imprisoned um, and that the father was very clever. He was actually known for being this very clever blacksmith, engineer, everything. And he um, made wings, okay, out of feathers from the birds who had come to their tower and wax. And he tells, you know, they, they kind of put on these wings um, and I can show you a picture of it. Okay, they put on these wings so that they can kind of escape and um, Daedalus warns Icarus don't fly too close to the sun because they, you know, the wings are held together by wax and if they get too close to the sun and the wax heats up then the wax is going to melt but Icarus being young and kind of like ignorant and not wanting to like listen to his dad he ignores his father's advice flies too close to the sun and eventually his wings melt and he drowns okay so to understand this poem according to Brugel when Icarus fell it was spring first you kind of have to know what painting they're talking about okay then you have to know the legend of Icarus and then the rest of it makes sense all right. And I think that sometimes that's certainly just been my frustration with poetry is that you have to know so many things. You can't just, you know, what was great about reading Harry Potter is you can just sit down and read Harry Potter and they, J.K. Rowling explains everything to you. She says, this is what Quidditch is because you've never heard of Quidditch because it's not a real thing. Uh, this is what a Gryffindor is. This is what a Slytherin is. Okay. Um, but in poetry, a lot of times nobody's there to explain it to you. So if you were just reading this and you didn't know who Brugel is and you didn't know who Icarus was, you would maybe just be very, very confused. Okay. Um, and so then the vocabulary you need to know would be plow, which is to kind of to loosen up the dirt so you can plant things. It's something that the farmers might do. Okay. And then pageantry. Okay. And what is kind of being dealt with in this painting here is that everybody is so busy going about to their day-to-day -day lives that they don't notice something truly momentous. Even this guy over here, he's just kind of minding his own business. Nobody's jumping in and trying to save Icarus. Nobody even notices that Icarus is drowning, all right? So you can put your thoughts on the painting itself or on the uh, poem, which really just kind of leads you through what the painting is. Um, and, you know, what your thoughts on are on that. Um, and I think that he's kind of reminding us, my, my guess is, William Carlos Williams is reminding us to um, um, kind of notice things around us and to notice the things that are really average and ordinary and think about what you know they mean. Uh, another really famous one by William Carlos Williams is the red wheelbarrow and it just says so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens and it's supposed to just paint a very simple scene. That's kind of what William Carlos Williams was really um, famous for. All right, so the next one we're going to do is Girls Can We Educate We Dads by James Barry. It's very different. Um, James Barry was uh, born in, um, oh my gosh, I've forgotten. Okay, but um, he was brain, he, I knew that he lived in uh, New York and uh, England. He was born in Jamaica. Okay, uh, so sorry. Um, and he lived in the United States and England and he published several books of poetry as well as a lot of children's literature. Okay, and you can see right away that he's got kind of an amazing usage of dialect. All right, so girls, can we educate we dads? And he says, listen, the male chauvinist in me dad, a girl walking night streets must be bad. He don't say the world's a free place for a girl to keep her unmolested space. Instead, he say a girl is a girl. So even though James 
Kingsbury is a male author, he's kind of pretending that we're having a conversation between a father and a daughter here. And the daughter saying, listen, you know, a girl should just be able to walk down the street. That's what she should be able to do. And every time the author says, he doesn't say, he don't say, the world's a free place, that's kind of what the daughter's hoping the father will say. The daughter's really hoping that the father will say, the world's a free space and you should just walk down the street and, you know, not get molested. Uh, he say, a girl walking, swinging hips about, calls boys to look and shout. He don't say, if a girl have style, she want to say, look, I okay from top to foot. Instead, he say, a girl is a girl, okay? Then um, this is a really common thing, okay, I think between parents and children. As a teacher, I know that sometimes a student will come to me and they'll have gotten a really good grade or they'll have accomplished something, they got into a college, a program, or something, and they'll say, my dad didn't even say congratulations. My mom didn't even say how impressed she was. And every time, you know, they start a sentence with, my parent didn't even say, I know that that's secretly what they're wishing, or not so secretly, um, what they're wishing. They're saying, my mom should have said she was impressed. My dad should have said, congratulations, I'm so proud of you. So this entire poem is that kind of a conversation. Okay, and I thought that that was really great. And there's a lot of use of connotations here. Connotation is when there's a secondary meaning, it can be a cultural meaning, an emotional association. Like if you tell me I'm frugal, that means that I'm uh, careful with money, which is true. Uh, and you've maybe complimented me. But if you say, Christina, you're so cheap, you're so miserly, you're so parsimonious, you're so penny pinching, I can keep going, you're such a Scrooge, all of that means um, that I'm too careful with my money, and all of that has a really negative negative connotation. And you can see the way James Barry uses negative connotations in Girls Can We Educate We Dads. He says, listen the male chauvinist and me dad, a girl too laughy laughy look too glad glad, just like a girl too looky looky round will get a pretty Satan by her side or at her side. So the idea that, you know, you're not just going to get a good admirer, a bad admirer, that this whole thing has multiple layers of connotations in terms of the words that they've chosen. And then here, chauvinism can be an extreme form and usually a very negative bad form okay of patriotism love for your country and nationalism it's kind of when you love it too much almost and male chauvinism is the belief that somehow men are better Okay, so this whole poem is addressed to male chauvinists. It doesn't mean all fathers are male chauvinists, but the ones who are, this is what they're trying to talk about. And then the next one is stifle, all right, is to suffocate or restrain. It doesn't have to be evil, all right? So here she, uh, that James Barry says, he don't say a girl full of go, don't want stifle talent coming on show, meaning like a girl who can do things, she doesn't want to stifle her own talent, okay? She doesn't want to restrain or suffocate her gift, her talent the things she wants to do okay um but it can also actually stifle can be used in a funny way as well so um sometimes i think it's just because uh i'm not mean enough sometimes um i'll tell my child that they're in trouble and i can see that they're like trying to laugh at me they're like trying to <laughs> like not laugh uh and trying to like stifle their laughter because it's they know it's the wrong time to be laughing at me okay um the next one is just a really really quick author recommendation because i could not find just one single poem to kind of go over uh kwame alexander was born in new york um i believe he still lives somewhere on the east coast uh he is quite excellent okay he does a lot of poetry and he does a, a much better job explaining poetry there's a, a link here where he kind of like talks through rhyming and things like that it's this one right here introduces borrowed poems okay um he's really just oh defines uh, poetry here Th these are both really really good videos that you should um again they're all linked here okay and he writes um a lot of poems that are about sports uh specifically i can think of at least two that were on uh basketball okay, that were both very, very, very good, I thought, um, and uh, worth reading. Um, one is called Crossover, and the other is called I'm So Sorry I've Forgotten, and I will totally find it in a second, okay. Um, that says book me. Oh no. Uh, oh, books and stuff. There we go. Okay. So one is called crossover and the other is rebound. Okay. So I know that those two are both about basketball. Uh, I know that booked is the one that mostly deals with um, soccer and then uh, swing is the one that has to deal with baseball. Um, and in there, it's not really necessarily just about the sport. Okay. But sport is kind of the um, theme that kind of the, the, the subject, the foundation that kind of like builds everything. And 
and again, I'm not usually a fan of poetry, but Kwame Alexander's stuff is really great. Okay, he has a really amazing ability of uh, playing with traditional po prose in a way that is fun, it feels playful and lively. Um, and, you know, this is how he explains rhymes. Acoustic rooster sat outside, strumming his bass guitar. He practiced jazz all summer long, so he could be a star. Uh, and again, the only reason I'm not doing a full lesson on him is I, I could not find just one single standalone thing. Um, I could find an excerpt from Swing, which um, is the baseball one, and you can just kind of see. His stuff is so fun. Tryouts, we go to check the list, and for the third year in a row, we aren't on it. Okay, like a lot of it is, I think, really um, plays with form and is lively in a way that a lot of poetry isn't. And I couldn't find Crossover, which is probably my favorite thing by him, but I found a two-minute thing where he um, is kind of talking about how he likes poetry and where he reads a short excerpt from it, so that's the link right here. Okay, and then the last one is Affirmation by Donald Hall. Uh, he's a very famous um, poet. He passed away a few years ago. Um, he was an American Poet Laureate, which means he won kind of the highest poetry prize. It's like the, you know, Academy Award of um, Poetry, okay? Was an American poet who was born in Connecticut, and I believe he lived almost exclusively in New England. I know he traveled around, okay? But um, I believe most of his addresses were in New England because he wrote a lot that's based in New England. And I have to admit that even though he wrote for decades and he published over 50 books in all sorts of different genres, um, I mostly know him for his latter work, okay? He, um, I forget if it was his first or second marriage, he married a woman who was much younger and he almost didn't marry her because the age difference was so great. And he thought, well, you're still gonna be young and I'm gonna get old and sick and you're gonna have to like take care of me. But then because life is ironic, um, she of course died first of cancer and then he was left to kind of mourn her and I just thought some of the poetry he wrote after that um, without is a great example old painted bed is another really great example um, is all really beautiful okay again I, I don't really like poetry but I do have some poetry that I'll read okay um, and it's called affirmation and he talks about how to grow old is to lose everything aging everybody knows it even when we are young we glimpse it sometimes and nod our heads when a grandfather dies then we row on for years on the midsummer pond ignorant and content okay so what i think is interesting about this poem affirmation is the entire poem is about it is an act of affirmation all right even though it's about loss it's titled affirmation because it's all about in some ways calling out supporting encouraging declaring all of the terrible things in life and yet at the end he says let us there's the word again stifle okay let us restrain under mud at the pond's edge and affirm that it is fitting and delicious to lose everything. It's such a nice surprising ending, I think. The idea that, yes, we lose everything at the end, that is part of life, but that there's still so much beauty that we can celebrate it. And I think that that's probably something that is um, important for us to think through. If you ever participate in speech and debate, you will argue the affirmative is one side where you argue the affirmation of something. And then he uses also this idea of debris, uh, you know, that a marriage that began without harm scatters into debris on the shore. Um, and I linked here to marine debris because I know it's something that um, all of my children really care about. Um, all three of my biological children are very concerned about the plastic in the oceans, which is, you know, one of the things I'm very proud of them for, all right? But the idea that, you know, we throw this trash and it sometimes gets into our oceans, gets into, you know, our animal, uh, what marine animals will eat it, and it's very, very bad, okay? And then the last word here that I wanted to point out is the strange. In here, there is a talk of a friend who estranges himself. And we've all, you know, when you're younger, you don't really see this as much. Maybe you do. Maybe you go to an elementary school and you have a best friend, but then you go, you, the two of you go to different middle schools and you become like strangers, even though you used to be best friends. So that process is called becoming estranged. It's used sometimes in divorce proceedings, actually, um, because two people who were, you know, once in love enough to get married have now become like strangers to each other so they become estranged um say yes by tobias wolf i linked it last time i should really link it again here okay um is another story where a married couple they argue over something very very silly and yet by the end because of this silly hypothetical argument they feel estranged from one another okay so um there are 15 questions here i will post the key as well it's got a little bit of vocabulary it's a shorter lesson
lesson because the poems were all fairly short. Um, and I'll post the key and post the notes and everything and hope everybody's staying safe. Thank you.